Good morning. Welcome to Umpang, Thailand. I just rode my scooter a few kilometers outside of Umpang to come up to a lookout point. I love lookout points like this because you basically can get here entirely by road. I took a, a paved road, really nice, windy paved road, all the way up here, shooting a time lapse on my uh, GoPro Hero 7 the entire way. And then here you can turn onto a dirt road that goes for like half a kilometer, and it brings you to this spot right here. And I came here last time, on my last, uh, my first visit to Umpang, and that was in the dry season. And I can't remember, to be honest, what this landscape looked like at that time. I'll have to go back and look at the uh, video, but I imagine it was quite brown and dry. And this is what it looks like now. Green and lush. And I guess uh, I'm not really that oriented, but of course that has to be Umpang, the town itself, down there. There's no other settlement of that size around here. So that has to be uh, Umpang. And I think the large white building that you can see on the right, kind of climbing up into the hills, I think that's the hospital. But again, I'm, I'm really just guessing. I get very turned around once I start following roads through hills and through mountains. I lose all sense of uh, direction. So, <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Hills are just really strange. They mess with your sense of geography. They really do. It's a beautiful view from here. And this isn't the main lookout point. Um, the main lookout point is uh, up there. And uh, there were, oh, it looks like there were a couple of people up there. And uh, I'm going to uh, head up there now, take a look from uh, up there. I came up here, of course, just to uh, check out the view in the rainy season when all the fields are full of uh, crops. But I also came up here just to kind of set up a camera and capture a few minutes of the scenery here as part of my newfound project of being my own personal National Geographic, just sort of capturing, um, I guess you'd call it B-roll, wouldn't it? I guess that's the YouTube phrase for it, just B-roll. Um, I did this yesterday. I spent about two or three hours down by a river just shooting video of uh, the water flowing over rocks, you know, creating some rapids. I don't think it turned out very well because I don't really have the right equipment to do that. <laughs> I think what you really need is a big tripod so you can raise your camera quite high. All I have are tiny tabletop tripods. So my various uh, GoPros and my Panasonic LX10 had to sit pretty much right on the ground and sort of aiming straight at the water. I haven't really reviewed the footage yet, but it may end up looking um, kind of uninteresting because you're looking sort of across 
and you're not getting sort of a downward view of all the rapids, but we'll see what it looks like. And the idea is to take footage like that and natural scenery footage and just put it all together without narration, perhaps with music playing in the background or just uh, the sound of the running water. Kind of like a, uh, a moving screensaver or something for a TV or a computer where uh, you just have some beautiful scenery playing in the background and you don't have to listen to me babbling away. Beautiful scenery out in this direction as well. Out there. As always, I'm not confident that the GoPro is capturing what it looks like to my eyes. Because again, the, the GoPro captures a wider field of view. And I think that kind of lessens the impact a little bit of what I'm looking at. But, um, yeah, it's very beautiful up here right now. And I imagine I'm going to get rained on at some point. Had tremendous uh, thunderstorm last night, a, rainst a rainstorm. The storm actually woke me up. That was about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, I think. And with my new project of uh, capturing falling rain and the sound of falling rain, um, I leaped out of bed, grabbed my uh, GoPro, and set it up to uh, film the, uh, the rainstorm at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's kind of a rainstorm at night at the guest house. But one big failing of a GoPro, of course, is that it has such a tiny sensor, it doesn't do well in low light. And then uh, I suddenly remembered again that I also have the uh, Panasonic LX10, which has a one inch sensor in it, much better for low light situations. So I ended up having two cameras running, the GoPro and the Panasonic, capturing this 3 a.m. Uh, rainfall. And I did that for like an hour and a half. And uh, when the rain stopped, I went back, uh, went back to bed. So I am looking forward to reviewing that footage. I haven't had a chance to uh, look at it yet because I just woke up and uh, came straight up here. Man, let's do a, let's do the cliche tourist thing and do a, a near 360. So there's the view behind me. That's back towards the road and the road follows along in the valley on the other side of this hill to a place called Palatha Village or Palata Village. view off in that direction. Really beautiful. Very glad I came up here. When I hopped on the scooter, I wasn't actually sure what direction I was going to ride in. And it was just sort of accident that I ended up riding in this direction. And now I'm very glad that I did. But a morning without rain and a bit of sunshine too. So yeah, there it is, a near 360. And as I, ro as I rode here the last time and on this trip, I, I, I had an, my eye on that hill, that limestone, that outcropping there, thinking there must be another viewpoint up there. And I keep looking for a trail. There has to be a trail following that ridge line going down to the uh, highway. And I stopped at a couple of spots to see if I could see a trail, but um, I couldn't pick one out. Alright, here is the landscape. Now, how best to capture this? How would a National Geographic videographer handle this situation? Time lapse or real time footage? I guess a long, long time lapse would capture the flow of clouds and sunlight through the valley. That would be kind of cool. That would mean uh, probably a very, very long uh, time lapse, but I have multiple cameras, so maybe that's what I'll do. I'll set one up for capture some real time footage and then maybe do a time lapse as well.
I'm still up here on the uh, lookout point. I just had a few cameras set up here shooting some uh, long video sequences of the valley and uh, Umpang. And uh, I set up a couple of, I got one camera up there in the tree actually shooting a uh, time lapse. It's been shooting for almost an hour and a half now, I think. It's shooting at uh, 30 times speed. So one hour would produce one minute of video. So an hour and a half will give me, uh, yeah, one minute, 30 seconds of uh, a time lapse of whatever was going on down in the valley. And while I've been sitting here, two or three uh, rain squalls have moved past, pretty heavy ones. Um, it's still raining right now, but battery died. <laughs> it's one thing when you're running uh, two or three cameras at the same time, batteries and memory cards are constantly needing to be replaced. And it just occurs to me, I don't know why I'm such a dummy, but I really am. But there's no way that GoPro in the tree has been running for an hour and a half. The battery would have died long ago. So if it's still up there shooting a time lapse, I'll be very lucky. I can't remember when I last put in a fresh battery. Anyway, hopefully I got something of interest. We'll see. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Rain can make your life so complicated because it's so difficult to do these things while holding onto an umbrella. And I'm using the umbrella, of course, to keep the camera dry. Um, I'm not worried about me getting wet. So uh, yeah, I'm holding the camera, the, the umbrella over the cameras and uh, I'm exposed. So my whole lower body is uh, soaking wet now. <laughs> and the battery died on this uh, GoPro Hero 9. And I just, I was having so much trouble holding onto the umbrella and getting the battery out and getting a new one from my knapsack that for a second I put the umbrella down without thinking and as soon as I put it on the ground the wind caught it and it went barreling over there towards the edge of the cliff and was about to get blown over so I go running after the umbrella and uh, grab it just before it disappeared <laughs> over the edge of the cliff so that's lucky I still have my umbrella but yeah I'm gonna see if this uh, GoPro in the tree is still running I'll bet it isn't and the rain has uh, the rain has stopped more or less just a little bit of a drizzle now but uh, let's go check on this uh, GoPro in the tree there it is up there oh I used my uh, chest mount to uh, put it up there oh the front screen is still powered oh yeah, is there a recording light? I can't tell from this angle. I have to climb up higher on these rocks. Maybe I can get a look down and see whether the recording light is still running on the back. Oh, I can't tell. I don't want to move the camera course, because that will uh, screw up the, uh, the time lapse. No, there's no way it's still running. Is it? <laughs> I can't tell. And if it's not running, though, why is there a power still running the front screen? Huh. Yeah, it can be so complicated running uh, cameras because... Uh, oh, man, these rocks really slippery right now in my sandals because my feet are soaking wet um with that gopro i had it mounted on my uh, chest like a chest mount and when i do that i turn off the led flashing light on the front the tally light because as I'm walking around uh, the city and, and interacting with people, I don't want this big red light flashing, you know, on the GoPro. Don't want to draw attention to the uh, camera. So I turn off the LEDs on the front. But now that I'm shooting a time lapse, it would be very useful to have the tally light on the front still flashing. But I turned that off and I forgot to turn it back on. So many details. But the sun is uh, coming back out. Down there, yeah, you can see some uh, sun on the hills. That's very nice. And uh, it's quite something to be up here when these rainstorms go through, because the last rainstorm that hit me, it's right down there now. 
it's moved from here down to the other side of the valley. You can actually, you know, physically see the rainstorm from a distance still falling from the sky. It's pretty crazy. But a little bit of a uh, blue sky coming out over there and right above me, check that out, actual sun. So, so things are looking up. More technical problems in that um, the uh, audio keeps cutting out on my system here and I realized that my GoPro mic adapter, the cord, you have to bend it really sharply in order to plug it into the GoPro because it was never meant to be used in a vlogging situation. GoPro designed this mic adapter to plug in a microphone in kind of a studio setting. So you wouldn't have to worry about where you put it. You wouldn't have to mount it or anything like that. But if you use a GoPro for vlogging and you put this mic adapter on your GoPro, you have to really bend the cord to plug it in. And I knew from the day I bought it that bending that cord so tightly was going to wear it out and break it. And I noticed today, yeah, it broke open. The, all the rubber, the thick rubber around the cord has um, degraded. And then when, when you bend it, it, it split wide open. So uh, it's, it's basically reached the end of its useful life, which is really kind of annoying. I experience this a lot with technology where everything breaks down and it seems to me that it's breaking down too soon. And I'm very careful with all my gear. I don't treat it harshly. I keep it all in cases. I don't bang it around um, and yet everything still breaks. So these days, to be honest, I was thinking, you know, you don't really buy technology anymore. I mean, I bought that GoPro mic adapter, but it barely lasted and it's already broken and I have to buy a new one. So really all you're doing is renting it. You're renting it for a certain amount of time from GoPro and then you just have to get a new one and start a new rental period on the next one before it breaks down. Though on the positive side, I'll probably, I probably won't buy a mic adapter. What I'll get, since I still have to plug in a microphone, I'll probably buy one of the GoPro uh, media mods, the case that goes around the GoPro, and then you plug a microphone directly into that cage, into the uh, media mod case. And I wanted to try one of those out. I haven't bothered buying one because I have the mic adapter, so I don't need it. But now that my mic adapter is uh, breaking and soon to stop working, yeah, I can buy a media mod, I guess. Instead of buying another mic adapter, I might as well try the media mod, see how that works. So here's the scene right now with the sun out. One thing I noticed up here, very interesting. I don't know if you can see it on the GoPro, but the sky here is filled with dragonflies. There's quite a, a flock, what do you call a group of dragonflies? There's probably a technical biological name for that, not a flock, but something of dragonflies. And they're quite interesting to uh, see. Oh, they all disappeared. They knew I was talking about them. So I'm really curious whether that GoPro is still running or not. I wanted to get to exactly one and a half hours of recording time and I, I'm about 45 seconds away. So once I reach that, that will give me a, yeah, a minute and a half of time lapse. And that's just enough to start with sunshine, move in and out of two or three rainstorms, and now we're back in sunshine again. So it might be a very, uh, yeah, maybe I'll let it run for another half hour if possible. Um, but I wish I really wish I could tell whether it was running or not. I'll take another uh, take another look. <laughs> Though my favorite, absolute favorite piece of gear for the GoPro is still the Jaws Flex clamp with the big Jaws, you know, the clamp. Because now I've just uh, clamped it to a tree over there. You know, you can just take that thing and <laughs> clamp it to anything around. So uh, that's kind of cool. I'm going to go uh, see if I can find out whether this GoPro is recording or not. Have to be uh, careful on these rocks with my uh, slippery sandals. Ah, oh, man. I 
can't see a red light. I can't see one. Um, uh, I'll be so disappointed if I ended up not capturing uh, anything at all. All right, I'm, I'm going to move it just to see. It's still recording. The red light is flashing. Huh. So that <laughs> I may have I probably moved the uh, perspective of the GoPro because I, I moved it. And maybe in the time lapse, you'll see it flip down and back up real fast. Huh. I'm very impressed with GoPro and I'm impressed with myself. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, lately, since I, I started experimenting with uh, uh, shooting in 4K again and shooting these long sequences where I set the camera up on a tripod and just let it run for, you know, 30 minutes at a time, I'm now experiencing GoPros overheating. And my GoPro Hero 9 has been uh, overheating and shutting down a lot. So I thought maybe the Hero 7, which is what I'm using up there, I thought maybe it uh, it might have overheated and shut down as well. No, it's still running. It's a workhorse. I don't know how much uh, battery life is left. But yeah, it's been running for an hour and 33 minutes. I'm going to give it another uh, 30 minutes to get to two hours. And that'll be two minutes of a time lapse. I don't know. It ought to maybe. I hope it's. Uh, I hope I aimed it to get a nice uh, perspective of the valley, but yeah, over there, I don't know if you can see it, but you can still see the rainstorms. I first called it a rain squall, but I don't know if that's accurate or not. On land, can you have a squall? I think a squall is only out on the ocean, right? So this would just be a, a rainstorm. It wouldn't be, I don't think it'd be correct to call it a squall. Wow, it's beautiful up here. I think this might be my only small adventure for the day. I was thinking of riding up here and then I was going to go back down and then ride through the valley, like down in below me. I did that before when I was here and it's a beautiful ride, but um, I don't think there's a, uh, with all the rain moving in and I've been up, I've been up here for several hours already. So I think this will be my day. And uh, I'll go, I'll do the valley ride. I'll do that uh, tomorrow, I think. See how, assuming I can head down that in, in that direction, I'm still not sure that I can because of all the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, restrictions. I might not even be allowed to go down that road. Guess I'll find out tomorrow. Another rainstorm moved in, so I'm cowering underneath the tree and underneath my umbrella. The GoPro Hero 7 in the tree is uh, set up to be waterproof right now, so it doesn't matter that it's out in the rain. But I have the Hero 9 connected to my Rode Wireless Go microphone, so uh, it's not waterproof right now. So I have to, uh, I have to hide and keep the uh, GoPro protected. Man, yeah, this uh, rainstorm came out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting it at all. I wasn't monitoring the sky. But I guess this is how the day is going to be for the rest of the day. I mentioned uh, the other day in a little video clip, though I don't know whether I'll end up posting it or not, so I'll, I might be repeating myself a little bit here. But um, yesterday, I ran into uh, a man from Switzerland, a young guy, very friendly guy, and we went and got a cup of coffee together. He actually uh, lives here in Mesod with his uh, with his family, and um, one of the coffee shops was open. You could get takeaway there, so we went and got the coffee, and we could sit at a table for a minute or two while they're you know preparing our coffee, and then we went and just stood in the parking lot and chatted for a while. And he had an interesting story to tell because. It relates, it's similar to my own situation and the situation of a lot of foreigners around the world that just have, well, foreigners, just people who happen to be in another country 
when the pandemic hit and then all the borders closed, which is more or less why I'm here in Thailand, of course, and my touring bicycle and all of my uh, other compu uh, computer gear, camera gear, camping equipment, everything is all still in Malaysia and I I've been waiting so I could go back and uh, get it. So that's my story and a lot of foreigners have a similar stories of being stranded, semi-stranded in different countries around the world. But this guy from Switzerland, he was living here in Umpang. He had a house, a job, uh, cats, you know, pets, household pets. And he just happened to go back to Switzerland with his family for a vacation. And while he was in Switzerland, the border closed. So his entire life was here in Umpang and he couldn't come back. So I think he was not allowed to return for about a year and a half, basically a year and three months, maybe something like that. And then he was finally able to get all the paperwork together and, and uh, get permission to return to Thailand. But me, you know, I keep talking about how my bicycle is trapped in Malaysia and oh, I can't get my bicycle. This poor guy, he couldn't even get back to his house and he couldn't get back to his pet cats and he had to keep paying rent on a house here that he wasn't living in and he had to contact uh, friends here to uh, take care of his cats for him and he just managed to return to Thailand two or three months ago so that was kind of an interesting story to, get to hear from him of course he, he's working here as, as part of a foundation uh, an NGO working with the local farmers I believe so yeah, it was very nice uh, experience to have a chat with him. And uh, if I stay here a few more days, you know, maybe I can get back in touch with him. And uh, I'd like to learn more about the work that he's doing here. That would be interesting. And speaking of gear, oh, I just realized that my reading glasses went missing. Again, because of the rain. Oh, again, gear is so complicated these days because I would normally have my reading glasses around my neck on a cord, but since I started putting a GoPro on a chest mount, I can't put my glasses around my neck anymore because they rattle against the GoPro and it records all that rattling sound. So now I've started putting my reading glasses away every time I don't need them anymore. Then I have to dig them out of my bag you know, um, put them back on, use them for five seconds, take them off, put them away. It's such a huge hassle. So while I've been up here, <laughs> instead of putting them away, I hooked them over one arm. I hooked them into my pants pocket and just left them dangling down there. But again, because I'm holding the umbrella and the camera and the rain and the wind, I kind of forgot about them. And I realized just now that they're missing. It's like, I guess they fell out of my pocket. And I just went out to, uh, <laughs> to track them down to see where I dropped them. And um, yeah, I found them over here. Oh, such a dummy. These are these weird uh, orange ones. But it turns out they not only fell out of my pocket, they fell to the ground and then I stepped on them somehow and broke them. So there they are. <laughs> there they are down there. Another uh, victim, reading glasses, a victim of my lifestyle. Man, I've broken so many of these lately, and I just keep buying new ones. That's weird. In the GoPro, they look yellow. They don't look orange. That's weird. I couldn't see them in the screen because I was looking for bright orange, but on the GoPro, they're, they're coming across as a yellow. Anyway, let's see if I, how badly I broke them. Well, there they are there. Yeah, they're completely broken. I, <laughs> I guess I stepped on them. I don't even remember stepping on them and, and just shattered the whole arm. I uh, snapped it right off. It's not the sort of um, break where I can put them back together. Oh, well, I can, uh, I can wear them. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I can't. I thought I could wear them over one ear, but they're not going to stay in place. Ay, ay, ay. Me and reading glasses these days. A small break in the rain. 
So I thought I'd put some uh, scenery behind me. <laughs> Another funny thing is my, my knapsack, you know, which I dearly love, this uh, Osprey Nebula. Um, it's so old now that whatever minimal waterproofing the material used to have is all completely gone. It's really just a giant sponge now. <laughs> so any water within 100 yards of this thing just seems to get like sucked into it. It's always uh, wet and damp. And a, uh, a mystery benefactor uh, sent me a new knapsack a few uh, weeks ago, a couple months ago now. A really interesting uh, knapsack, which actually is, um, what's the name of the company again? The one that makes all the high security bags with the rip proof mesh inside and all the locking mechanisms and the cables embedded in it. I can't think of the name of the company right now. But anyway, that bag is 100% waterproof. So that would have been ideal to have today. Unfortunately, I tried using that bag as my daily driver, you know, my daily knapsack, and I love it in many ways, but it's too small. It can't hold everything that I carry around with me during the day. Um, I can just barely get sort of the minimum amount of camera gear in it, but then it is packed right to the top. So I can't really rummage around in it. In order to get anything out of the bottom, I've got to remove everything on top. So I haven't really been able to incorporate that bag into my day-to-day -day life. I've used it when, you know, before, just going out for little short trips. But for a day like today, with all the gear I'd bring with me, yeah, it's just not big enough, which is unfortunate. But yeah, I do love my... Uh, my Osprey bag. But uh, <laughs> as I said, it's a sponge. It just soaks up all the water that hits it. Yeah, something else um, I learned uh, yesterday, I was talking with the manager of my guest house about renting a room there for a full month, you know, for 2000 baht, as I said, plus utilities. And he said, um, yeah, you know, absolutely. If you want to rent that room for the month, that would be great. And he said, if you are here for a month, you could volunteer. Apparently, the manager of the guest house is part of this organization that is offering volunteer services to families in remote farming uh, communities that are, are suffering from the, uh, the effects of the pandemic. And I couldn't quite get all the details from him because of, you know, he does speak English, but some of the details weren't entirely clear to me, but I guess he's active with this volunteer group and they go out to these uh, villages and um, help them in any way they can. They do labor if someone falls ill or if someone dies, you know, they help out the family, bring them to the hospital, give them transportation and, and, and volunteer labor on the farms, different things like that. I couldn't quite figure it all out. But uh, it's interesting that he's a member of this uh, volunteer group. And uh, on sun yesterday, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. Um, I noticed how busy the city was. Umpang was full of people. When I met up with the man from Switzerland for coffee, the coffee shop where we got our takeaway coffee was right beside a bank. And there were, I don't know, eight or nine scooters parked right there, seven or eight trucks. It was like a, a major traffic jam for Umpang. And there were crowds of people at the bank and in front of the ATM. And I had no idea what this was all about. But this man from Switzerland, he speaks Thai. He's lived here a long time. And um, he had some idea of what was happening, that on that day, once per month, local people are getting money from the government, a kind of COVID-19 relief package. And to get this money, they have to come in from the, uh, from the remote villages, come into Umpang, and they get a certain amount of money every month from the government that's either deposited to their bank account, and they have to withdraw it from the ATM, or they have to go to an office. I wasn't quite clear on the details. Because I noticed I went to 7-Eleven afterwards and 7-Eleven was jammed with people. And not only was it full of people, these people all took a long time for their transactions because when they went up to the cash register, they all had to give their government ID card, which had some kind of a chip in it. 
and then they had to enter a code in the machine and then do all these, you know, enter their PIN, uh, things like that. And I guess they're transferring money from the card or doing something. I'm not quite sure what they were doing, but it was connected with this monthly relief package as well. But all of these people were clearly not accustomed to doing this. None of them had any idea what to do, how to enter their numbers on the number pad and swipe their card and do all these things. So every single person in line ahead of me just took forever to complete what their, you know, complete their transaction. I think I was in 7-Eleven for, I don't know, 45 minutes, just waiting to get to the cash register to pay for my, you know, bottle of milk. But I enjoyed just sort of hanging out and, and watching all the activity, all the people um, doing all these uh, transactions. You know, I thought that was kind of interesting, even though I didn't really understand uh, what they were doing. Well, with the sun out, um, groups of people are coming up here, and I think I'm going to uh, pack up my cameras and uh, leave for now and uh, give up the place to them. A lot of people are coming up here to have a picnic, so <laughs> I'm going to take pity on them. They get a little nervous when a foreigner is around. You know, they don't want to disturb me or get in my way. So I'm going to uh, pack up, see if my GoPro is still capturing this uh, time lapse, and uh, hit the road and probably head back to the guest house, um, copy some of these video files, have a cup of coffee. And there's my, as I said, my GoPro up in the tree right there. Just occurred to me I might even be sitting in the field of view now. I might be sitting in the time lapse. <laughs> Anyway, let's go uh, check on that uh, GoPro. Okay, I've successfully retrieved my GoPro from the tree and it had shut down. It wasn't operating anymore just now when I went to get it, but apparently it shut down. The battery died finally, but it ran right up until exactly three and a half minutes of time lapse. So that, yeah, that's more than I expected to get. So that's pretty cool. I don't know whether it's any good or not, or whether even when you look at it on this tiny screen, it's kind of hard to see what it is you got. But I won't be able to see how it really looks until I load it onto a computer or onto, onto my phone. I may, have <laughs> I may have set it up wrong with too much foreground, like too much land in front of it, too much rock and not enough sky. Because when I put it up in the tree, I couldn't really see the screen, so I wasn't really sure how I framed, you know, how I, how I set up the composition.
one last look at the scenery before I leave. Man, it is beautiful up here. And you probably can't see them, but the skies are filled with those uh, dragonflies again down there. I'm glad I stayed out here all through the rainstorms because now I get to see the uh, scenery with the sunshine again just as I leave. So that's nice. And I guess tomorrow I will be right down there. There's the road heading through the valleys. So that's where I'll be uh, driving tomorrow down through this river valley. I think it must be a uh, lunchtime. A lot of people are riding up here on their motorbikes and uh, taking a break at the, uh, at the viewpoint. And I think this really is the end of today's, uh, this morning, I should say, not today, but this morning, small adventure and uh, the video documenting it. <laughs> and uh, a morning of rain on top of the uh, lookout point. So uh, see you in the next video.